Hello, hello. Hello, everyone. Hi. Hey, hi. Welcome <laughs> to Welcome. the April Meetup. Welcome all. Uh, I don't know how many we There's are currently. There's a few people. Yeah. 49. 49 already. at the moment? Yeah. Um, well, as usual, like we're coming in, uh, we are coming in, we are joining from Paris, where uh, Prismic HQ is located, like we are in our regular studio. Yeah. Don't hesitate to let us know where you are joining us uh, from. Uh, and, uh, and now you are going, what's the weather there? Um, starting to be good on our side in uh, in Paris, like spring is coming. Yeah, it's coming but slowly. slowly. I was in Morocco this weekend. It was, it yeah. was already there. Okay. But yeah, I'm coming from like if you come from Morocco, the comparison the comparison is a bit it's complicated. Hard. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, our guests today come from LA, so I guess they they can compete with that. Yes. Possible. Um, <laughs> so we have uh, people from Atlanta. Um, so Gary is from Atlanta, and Alexa from the UK. It's cool. It's good to see. And yeah, Sam from Sweden. <laughs> so going it's good to see Sweden. people from all around the world. That's really cool. And uh, as always, like the whole uh, community that joins is like uh, all over the place. Like we try to build uh, also a company and the uh, and the product that reflect that. Like uh, in, in Prismic today, uh, we have like, uh, I don't know, 30, 40 nation different nationalities. Many. I many. don't know how many, but many. Joining uh, all over the all over the globe uh, and and continuing to to look for bright people that are coming from uh, uh, everywhere in the in the world. Uh, I'm Renaud for those who don't know me. I'm leading the product at Prismic, and uh, today it's Noah who is with me. Yes, I'm Noah. I'm normally behind the scenes. <laughs> uh, I organize the meetup um, every month, and uh, I'm part uh, at Prismic at the uh, on the uh, marketing team and the community team. So my role is to figure out who Prismic is great for and to introduce that product to those that uh, we think it can bring value to and to also um, connect with our community so that we see what cool things people build with it. Um, the goal of this meetup is to bring uh, experts in the matter of building websites with Prismic and to uh, get them to share their knowledge and expertise um, on best practices and insights they have on how to um, both build the project, but also manage and organize the projects to make them successful. So that's what we're going to be doing today. And the second goal of this meetup is to tell you uh, what we're working on and what we're just about to launch. And so we have uh, exciting updates for you also today, specifically for the next people. But before we start and waiting for more people to join, um, we have a little question for you because it's been a big thing for us at Prismic this month is that we've all been like trying uh, chat GPT and AI stuff in the context of our work. And we thought it would be nice to know like what you guys, uh, if you guys tried it and we're curious to know uh, what, you've, what you've tried it for. And so you, what did you try it for? So, so many things. Okay. Uh, I don't know if I've really used it for so many things, but tried it for many things. Um, hmm. I guess lately, I've been trying to generate content for our website uh, with it. Okay. So I would give it like the goal of why am I making a page, um, the context of the value we bring to, for instance, I was we're working on a Prismic for agencies page. So it's like making, like giving the kind of uh, the whole context of the goal of the page and asking it to generate content for me. I'm not, I, I don't, I'm not saying we used that content yet, but it's already like an experiment that we did to see if like we can do the strategic parts of the work and then we can um, use it to generate the copy for us. And, uh, and so you say we are not using it yet because 
like what's the reason it's not mature enough at the moment or, or like you don't you didn't find yet the right formula to be able to use it i guess we've been trying it uh but for projects where we already created some uh, content just to compare with like would have would it ha would have it would it would it would it have allowed us to <laughs> i don't know about the tense there um <laughs> to uh, make the to to make our processes uh, quicker so it allowed us to like fix a few things on okay. our outline but not really like go from scratch and like use it really for a whole new project um what uh, alexa is saying uh i also used it personally to study for my wact level two course okay what it's a training, training about, about wine. wine ah nice actually now that you say it my ex-roommate uh did that training that's true and lucy knows it okay <laughs> what did you use it for Renaud? uh so it's funny I, I i used it for a couple of things um so as you know, we did a few experiments also on content and generating it, so that was an interesting an, an interesting things. Uh, what I do is that I use it um, professionally for product management related tasks or even design tasks. Like uh, we used it, for example, just to, generally speaking, to help us writing our user story, change logs. Um, we used it to te battle test design, something that works very very well like when we actually want to test like uh, different content in the design to see how it will fit, not fit, is it too long, too not too long, how a component will react, for example, uh, depending on those kind of things, working well. So you generate copy and then you test it in your Exactly, in your and you see okay. how it looks like, like nice. uh, compiling, uh, compiling error messages, for example, through the API or through the, an interface. Um, a few things like this, we give it a try to, um, and I give it a try already today to try to <laughs> generate an outline and how can we run the conversation around this uh, d the, this uh, this meetup. So doing meta research. <laughs> meta, <laughs> meta research. Uh, it gave me a few interesting uh, questions, by the way, <laughs> by the way, on the topic. But uh, yeah, no, f a lot of things. I, I think it's going to change um, uh, w the way we work, generally speaking, mm -hmm. in a, in an important way. Um, and I think it's going to change also the way people use our product. So it's very interesting to think about it because basically the product that we build is also a reflection of the way we work. Yeah. Um, and so I think it's uh, important to get uh, to get to the bottom of it and try to 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 maximize our, our, un our understanding to try to then direct the product in the right direction related to that. Okay. Yeah. So, well, a few few comments then, wine and spirit, spirits. Yeah, uh, Louise is saying that she tried it for um, to help her set set up a view three site with Prismic. Oh, okay, nice. Nice. So that's something you can use on the product then. Yes. Help people create websites. Maybe. Them. Yeah. Maybe, maybe, but it's being used by a lot of people in our team, and I know that. Uh, People at Usual Five also used it because we discussed it in the prep of the yeah. uh, of the meetup. So maybe Jason would uh, talk about it quickly after and uh, and let us know uh, and let us know how he used it for. But uh, yeah, that's something. Okay, so that's a good way to meet journey prompts. Yes, Samuel has been introducing that to me. We can talk about that as well. <laughs> but that's for me is a good way to introduce and to bring in the team of uh, Usual Five. So just for the students to bring them in, they're here in <laughs> <Now>? <laughs> I get like <laughs> okay now they're here hello everyone how's everyone doing hi great hey doing well hey everyone so it's hey. very early for them for you because you're in LA so for me here it's like 6 p.m. how what time is it for you we got about 9 a.m. so not too bad it it's uh it's 9 9 a.m. right oh, that's okay no, that's no, okay yeah that's okay. Not very early. Not very early. I early. thought earlier. Earlier. <laughs> okay. Earlier. Yeah. But we've been preparing this meetup already. So like you, you, you woke you up and you were like in like front you. of your laptops for, for some time already. Uh, well, thank you for joining us. Um, let Levi introduce uh, your agency. But the context is that um, Usual5 is a certified Prismic partner. And I know you've been building websites for like years now with Prismic. So it's great to have you here so that you can share through the example of um, the website you've built for Camper Museum, um, your expertise on how do you uh, approach these kinds of projects from the design to the development phase. But let's awesome. first 
get an intro about your agency. And you guys. And yes. you guys, of course. <laughs> yeah. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Everyone yeah. can hear you okay. Yes, oh, that's great. Um, I'm Levi, CEO, co-founder of Use All Five. On the call, we have uh, Jason, as well as my CTO and partner, and then Jen, who is a senior developer and built the Kemper website, and Maxine, who's a art director who designed the Kemper website. So we'll go over that in a second. But um, yeah, we started Use All Five about 15 years ago. Jason and I met at UCLA Design School. Um, what you see here is our uh, current website. Um, a lot of the work we do, if you poke around, is a nice mix of arts and culture clients. Uh, we'll look at an arts and culture client today, which is a museum. So lots of museums, artists, uh, you, you name it. Um, but also <clears throat> a lot of work in the tech industry. So uh, a lot of work for Google um, and other clients uh, such as Spotify and Indeed um, on that side too. So. Um, but we've been a huge fan of Prismic. Even our own uh, personal website is built in Prismic. We're a fan of uh, mostly the, the module approach to it and, and the ability to have um, kind of creative control on the front end and kind of that you know, headless approach has been really amazing as well as the price point. So um, huge fan of it. Um, and uh, we continue to use it on a lot of our arts and culture client projects. Unfortunately, Google doesn't let us use it on a lot of their projects. Those mostly have to be custom built from the ground up. Um, with Python and other uh, technologies. But today what we'll do is um, go through kind of the upfront of Kemper Museum, uh, really touch on all the details of that, and then get into um, actually how we designed and developed it um, with Maxine and Jen and Jason. So um, to start, all, we can jump right into uh, what the Kemper Museum is. Yeah, it's sure. a uh, museum out of Kansas, Kansas City. Um, they've been around for a little while. Contemporary art, uh, so art after about 1915 on and on, um, and you know, it's really awesome in that it's an experience that's free and open to all. So if you if you go to Kansas City, highly recommend this. Going to this museum, there's museums in that area. So you know, it's you know when they came to us, um, they had just rebranded. Uh, you know, they really wanted to separate themselves from the other museums in Kansas City, as well as you know have a voice on the global stage. That was a big deal to them. So. Um, brand identity is, as is, is you can see on the website, especially if you start scrolling, you'll see a new uh, you know, little KM logo symbol that they use, which is kind of a, a device to uh, bring to life um, and punch out sometimes, so you'll see some of that. But um, yeah, very dynamic website, lots of white space, um, feels alive. We really wanted to convey kind of the community aspect and the nature of the museum and how it connects to Kansas City and their point of view, um, as well as their collection and events and so forth. So um, the previous website was was pretty stale. Um, it didn't have that dynamic aspect to it. Um, didn't really capture um, a lot of the branding um, elements that were coming through in the new brand identity. So um, they really wanted um, the website to excite people as they were investigating where they should visit in Kansas City. They wanted to express kind of the point of view, the artwork you would see there, the exhibitions, um, as well as you know the opportunity to have an amazing meal. They have a they have a actually award-winning restaurant there, uh, hmm. and so forth. So, uh, really wanted to showcase um, a lot of different elements um, and really, you know, how they connect back to the community, which I think is really important. Um, cool. So, what well, what we do from a process standpoint usually um, up front is we deep dive. We have a lot of stakeholder conversations with um, you know, different members at the museum. Um, we also start to talk to guests, people that have gone to the museum, people that are considering going to the museum, um, mm. those that are members of the museum. We really want to hear how they're using the current website, what they'd like to get out of the website. Uh, if you go over to the tab, um, I think we do have some of our strategy work up front that we do. I think it's that third tab or fourth tab over, yeah. Um, or this might be more of the design direction. But, um, you know, with that strategy work, it really influences um, our designers and really gives them um, the groundwork for which to, you know, build out and kind of construct this. And so we also like to bring our developers into as well during this process to, you know, poke holes at things, think about the user experience, um, what are the most important you know, aspects of these things? Um, so 
with that being said, um, I can sh we can show what is really exciting for us is um, actually some of the behind the scenes work. So what Maxine's going to walk through here really quickly at first is the first round of design, what we show. Um, and before this, we've done some wireframes and some sketches and talking, obviously lots of dialogue and conversations with our client at the Kemper. But this, what we'll show here is the first round of design and the three early directions of the design. Um, and Maxine will walk you through that right now. Super clear super and super clear. cool. Awesome. Um, so that's super interesting because we have the CEO, the CTO, the senior developer and the uh, art director, director that worked on the project. So like we can cover the whole project basically. And uh, <laughs> that's, that's, that's great. Um, we have 75 people watching now. So what I would be super interested in is knowing like from the people who are here, how many of you are developers how many of you are working on design so that also it helps us frame the conversation yeah, for sure. um so that we know and don't hesitate if you have any question that could help you in your own projects either on design on development on brand also to post it on the chat that's that's the goal of this conversation so yeah go to the chat and tell us also for people for the 75 people who are here um what part of the projects do you specialize in um and so yeah, we could jump directly in the design discussion and the, the design direction that you that you led, Maxine, uh, like uh, during that process. Like, please guide us through the whole direction that you that you've been uh, discussing with uh, Kemper and how you actually led this process, so that we get the audience understand a bit better what was your process and interact with it. Sure. Um, I'm Maxine. I'm an art director at Use All Five, and um, yeah, there was a lot of strategy work up front that informed this first round of design. Um, and let's walk through the deck. Um, I think we can skip the first few hmm. slides and just jump into direction one. Um, but yeah, these first few slides are just setting the stage um, and going over the brand deck that uh, we provided earlier on. This first direction is the direction that they ended up choosing. Um, and if you go to the next slide um, and keep going, we were playing with these brand attributes. And as you'll see over the, the three directions, um, this spectrum will change per direction. So we're just trying to like gauge like what the client uh, wants visually with their, with their redesign. Um, and yeah, this first direction, we were playing with a bit of masking with the logo. Um, we didn't end up keeping this hero section, but yeah, definitely just wanted to push it um, in these earlier design stages. Um, I think if you keep going, um, this is the full uh, height of the homepage. And as you can see, a lot of this stayed the same per the current site, the current live site, um, which yeah. is really exciting. Um, the color changed a little bit, but yeah, just like that, and the white space and the, the type driven design, pretty image driven, um, all stayed true, which is really exciting. The next two directions were a bit more experimental, um, more color involved. This one was super friendly if we keep going. Um, oh, yeah, yeah playing with different. angles. Yeah, yeah completely different. Um, so there were elements of this direction that we brought into the final um, design, but yeah, I think they wanted to have a little bit less color and just let the the art yeah. and the work speak for itself. Um, and then this third direction was the most experimental. Um, let's keep going. Yeah. Yeah, this like very condensed chunky font, and then if we t if we click through, uh, we were playing with like a scroll driven like page turn, so sort of breaking out of that normal two D web space, and yeah, using a gradient, very out there, super fun. Um, but I think they wanted to have a little bit more of a dialed back experience. Yeah. That's super interesting how like also you are, you're able to like, give different directions so that the so that the team can decide what they connect with the most. So yeah, and, and then kind of you as you said maybe reuse some elements of other directions into the when you decide on one. So that's that's super interesting. We actually had a, a few answers. So we have a, a lot of developers. 
um, and some people who are pretty generalistic looks like so people who do both design front end and marketing for their clients so I think it would be interesting um, for everyone actually so that also for developers to better understand the whole design process for also when when we're going to talk about development process to learn from you uh, but yeah thank you everyone for telling us also what's interesting for you don't hesitate if you have any questions um, we'll take them during the during the conversation and so we do have a first question that is on the fact that uh, some people are asking if those were just uh, direction so pre-work basically and um, or like how much do you go about like um, how do you say going in depth on the actual direction because they were very impressed by the actual depth and uh, and quality and uh, um, finesse let's say of uh, like those concepts that you explore so like how do you approach that yeah um I think we try uh, as an agency to, in the first round, really push the design and make it as realistic as possible, um, which is why we put a lot of effort into the prototyping and making sure the directions are high fidelity and also very different. Um, it's a good way to gauge what the client wants and um, people like to react to something. So uh, yeah, it's just a good way to kind of um, see what they're looking for. Um, we typically a design or we typically assign a designer to each direction. So that helps okay. differentiate the different directions too. Okay. So you have almost a personal identity related to the brand identity that you, that you are creating for an agency, like, uh, direction one is Maxine, maybe direction two is yes. someone else. Okay. Yes, That's exactly. Okay. That's good. That's good. It reduces the bias of preferring one and pushing mostly f just just for one, <laughs> and really like going deep into <laughs> three of them. So that that's really cool. That's really cool, mm -hmm. and it works well because then we see how much like the first direction actually is pretty close to the end result because you pushed it pretty far. Actually, that's really cool. Um, so we have a few questions. Um, let's take one. Uh, do you guys have a uh, tough time with clients uh, blending the various uh, so directions? How do you manage consistency of one direction and not becoming like uh, having some kind of, let's say, Frankenstein monster yeah. uh, <laughs> of all directions <laughs> you're doing? Yeah, that can happen, um, definitely. Um, and I think we did pull elements from the second direction into the final direction. Um, it's a bit hard to avoid. You, I mean, you kind of have to do what the client wants, but we were really lucky with this client. Um, they were very flexible and understanding. And I think that's why the final site turned out so well um, is because they kind of gave us um, agency to do what we thought was best, um, of course, with their feedback. But the Frankenstein effect can happen at times. And we just try and push back when we see it uh, happening but yeah um it, it it is a collaboration between like us and the client and we were lucky like the client was had a clear vision for what they wanted yeah it really feel like it's maybe connected to what you're saying about the clear vision but uh reading back after um after the, the project about your the initial goals that you had it's very interesting to see how they actually connect to the end result the aspect of connecting better the re the um, uh, museum journey with the restaurant experience, the fact of insisting this is an experience for everyone that is free is very visible, while still like having a big space given to art, uh, but not only art as like you come and contemplate art, but also there's activities to develop um, to for the for the visitors. So it's very interesting how you kept the same goals and were able to like um, bring them to life through design, and so. That's that's also I can see it in the presentation in a way that you start from that, but also maybe from the client knowing what they want and still being focused on the on the end goal. Totally, I think that strategy deck and our strategy team does such a good job with that upfront work of um, stakeholder interviews and like they do a competitor audit, um, and that really is helpful too in making sure that the end product is quality and consistent with the client. So yeah, that deck was extremely helpful as well. Okay. Cool. Awesome. And I th 
I think it connects also to another kind of constraint that you can have in, in being creative and representative of a brand that is like the connection with technology. Yeah. And so um, like, how do you approach that as a team? And maybe it's the moment maybe to uh, start introducing also Jason and Jen in the discussion on how basically do you connect like technology and engineers in the process of uh, creating that brand and, uh, and how does the collaboration happen? Yeah, with design, you mean? Between design and engineering, basically. Yeah. So we, we have a fully integrated uh, development team where developers come in at the beginning of projects and consult um, to kind of, they'll look over some of the designs. Uh, and what I really push for is for the developers not to shut down any wild ideas and to uh, maybe guide designers to, uh, to show what kind of is possible and what isn't, but then come up with solutions at the same time of what of how they could really make like magical ideas happen. Um, so there, there is that that design development constant conversation happening, like in our Slack channels and and things like that. That and and the Figmas to to really make sure that our design and development is like just comes out really superb. Okay, well that's that's very interesting because we we see that often as like basically technology and creativity and design fighting i'm not a believer that uh, it's actually true i i more i tend more to believe like you that it's actually a connection that engineer can come up with like creative ideas on how to solve a problem or to develop a brand and uh, and, and I, I i agree with that philosophy i think it's the it's the right way to approach this and it shows basically in the way here you design you think about the interaction design but also it, sh it, sh it shows some kind of craft in the engineering and uh, like how do we solve problem also for example we'll talk about the search later and it's also reflecting i guess just in your camera and your uh, your background uh, jason like we can see art behind you and uh, all these kind <laughs> of uh, nice things that reflect by basically this um, like go against this caricature of uh, uh, engineer being uh, like uh, uh, airy guy, not creative, not thinking about how things that looks good and all this kind of stuff. While the 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 the, the work changed so much in the in uh, in in the past uh, in the past years that uh, new job like creative developer jumped in and uh, and and this connection is like uh, so important as of today that uh, I think it's good that we talk about that. Um, yeah. I, I feel like it's uh, it's true, like even in, in my team, Samuel, that you can see in the chat is a creative developer at Prismic. And so he has this very like interesting connection of like really caring about the experience that he delivers as a developer and having a very strong connection. He, like actually he's part of every design meeting that we do. So that like delivering that experience through um, development. And so one thing that would be interesting, I think, to talk about, because we have a lot of developers today, mm. is that I feel it was something that was interesting for you. For your case is that you've built a lot of projects with uh, kind of a similar stack that I feel that maybe there's an opportunity there for you and you tell me if I'm wrong of like having this like uh, foundational stack that allows you to deliver the value of the website and to like have that like machine kind of proven and rolling so that you can focus your time on the extra elements of like, add, like specific features for the client specific experiences you want to ship for the client so I'm interested in knowing like what's kind of your foundation for projects and then how that like kind of frees up time and and mental space to to focus on what's unique about each project. Um, so I'll, I'll kind of connect this to to the slices um, yeah. and have had Jen also uh, kind of take over. But we uh, we once the, the project is kind of designed, we then have the designers pull out all the components into into uh, like slices. And then um, maybe Jen want to walk us through some of the the kind of slices that we've done on Kemper. And, and yeah. maybe it's a good connection to because we jumped very fast into from brand identity without actually talking about the website and the way you actually end over mm -hmm. and like structure your Figma file. We, I know that we wanted to go through that before jumping maybe into the code. You let me know, you guide me. If you prefer to go for Figma first and then code, you let me know. Uh, yeah, we can jump into the Figma. Yeah. Okay. All right, yeah, so. Yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll just start over here is the, like the, all of the web, all of our sites, the designers put together all of the different screens. And then, and then we have our modules and our slices and I'll let Jen take it away. 
Yeah, we have a page with um, with the view of all of our slices together. It's um, a big long page essentially. So we have our dev designer handoff and we talk about just everything that they've created. I like to really absorb um, all the patterns and find things that are very similar and try to minimize the work that developers have to do um, by reusing pieces and parts everywhere that I can. So, um, and just like the site that's been beautifully designed, we try to make a really nice experience for our clients in the CMS with Prismic. So every time we put a slice together, we think about how it can be reused on other pages. Um, would they want different content in the same design? Uh, things like that. So we want our clients to update and change the content in the future without us, uh, without impacting their brand or performance. Um, and so for Kemper, they have a lot of exhibitions and artwork that they're constantly changing or adding and they'll want to feature that in a really beautiful way. So um, in this, what you're scrolling through now is just breaking out these pieces and parts, giving them names that can be recognizable. Um, and we actually take screenshots of these. Um, and this was before um, the slice simulator, which is really nice to have. Um, but we take in our screenshots here and apply them to Prismic um, so you can see those. Actually, I think we did use Slice Simulator. That's a little uh, misspeak on my end, but um, yeah. So we break things up and try to make it really efficient. That's super cool. So you take pages that designers give you and you actually assemble like a long, 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 so not really page, but long list of all the slices you have. And then you try to figure out what are the common elements across these slices um, to like kind of group the slices that look alike in like in, in like uh, together or one after the other. I wonder if I should make a connection with slice variations there or maybe not. So um, you tell me. Um, yeah. Yeah. We, and we even yes. break it out into the slice variations for sure. Okay. That's super cool. And so you mentioned something also that sometimes you even try to anticipate what would be the next uh, kind of or other variations that the team would need that don't necessarily figure out in, like are in the design of the first pages that will be released but also try to think of like how these slices would expand into new ones for future slices or future pages right so and this is something that kind of develops naturally in our content importing process so we'll build out the slices um, and I'll work with the designers to think through how they wanted it to work. Um, for this website, we have a lot of content relationships. So, yeah. and the goal there is, you know, there are pieces of content that need to work together. We have artists, we have artwork. We don't want duplicate entry for those things. We want them to connect as easily as possible with the least amount of work being duplicated by the client. So um, we, we think through those systems and and say like okay well they'll want to use this for you know one type of content but as our content entry gets in there and builds out our pages they'll say oh we need to use it slightly differently um, and then we'll tweak we made a variation of um, this like program slice you're looking at right now and we made it more of an auto pull so okay. you could you could add each piece manually or you could just pull in the, the programs um, with different settings Okay, that's cool. Very cool. And so, so here you uh, you showed us like um, how to basically come from design to code. Um, how is it? How is it working to basically? Wh what was your process to hand over to your customer or at least partner with them to integrate them to to basically uh, onboard them and introduce them to Prismic, the concept of it, uh, and how to choose. A CMS, how to migrate, all this kind of item. Can you can you lead us a bit through that? Uh, sure. Um, so because we we love using Prismic, it's a pretty easy sell to um, to the clients. We just kind of say this is this the CMS could could really like it gives you full control over the designs using the slice pattern, um, and then. Um, 
and and then so if and then we also we we also like to use Vercel as the as the host, and that's a pretty easy sell as well. It's not that expensive, and um, and it also it, it lets you have lightning fast websites with Next.js, and so that's kind of our our whole package. The we like to use Next, Prismic, and Vercel, um, and the the key is easy to upload or easy to update. Uh, content entry is going to be pretty easy. Um, and then you're going to have a really fast, nice looking website at the end of the day. Um, nice. OK, so it feels like um, for, for the client, uh, what they care about is what well, you mentioned many times the cost and how like um, how much it fits into their constraints or uh, like their budget constraints. But also you mentioned like easy to use. So to update content after that, in the end, they will have a fast and kind of branded kind of website that they came to you for so the whole like rebrand of the site that's really cool and as long as it achieves these goals for for them they trust you in the on the on the choice of tools exactly that's cool and then the onboarding becomes smooth like there's like is it something that you prepare with them since i'm guessing for them it was a new new tools or is it like that even something that you had to organize uh, for uh we we so what we love is when the client can join our slack and the, who's ever adding content to the website can be in there and kind of get a feel of how to um, how to work with the the site. So as we're building slices and pages, content types, the client could already be in there and uh, learning with us on on how to how the new platform is going to work. Um, that's the ideal situation. Uh, only really happens on the bigger projects. Um, on the more smaller projects, what we usually do is just put together uh, just screen recording videos on how like we'll we'll give them like a pdf of the all the slices and then a the screen recording video on how to how to edit the content types in prismic that's cool mm -hmm. that's cool um so we're get, I, i'm i'm about to like we don't have a lot of time left for that section but i want to like leave also some space for the chat to ask questions mm -hmm. uh, specifically because um we have you, Jason, who's the CTO of the of the company, and also Jen, uh, who like led the aspect of development. So, if for anyone currently building a website, if there's something that you're not sure you're doing properly, or co like um, connecting with either designers or the marketing team properly, don't hesitate to ask. Uh, one last thing that was really nice that I want that we wanted to touch on yep. is a specific feature that you've built for them. So on the search part. So maybe while um, while we uh, leave some space for the chat to ask uh, maybe one or two questions uh, to you while we have you here, let's maybe talk about that and uh, the search that you've implemented and what was how does that connect with the goals that um, they had as uh, for the museum um, for their website. Awesome. Yeah. So uh, they have a. a big permanent collection of work and uh, there's different types of artwork. So you've got your paintings, your sculptures, photographs. Um, the artists have, the, the artists are also tagged to different artwork and we didn't want to have to, to type in like redundant content, like Jen was saying earlier, um, like we wanted just a relational field. So what we did is we created our own search engine using, um, AWS's cloud search. It's a little old technology, but it, it works really well. And uh, what we were able to do was just create a, uh, a, a search engine on here that allows for uh, both reductive and inclusive searches. So you can, you can filter works on paper and photographs um, or different types of artists um, and um, be able to, to like filter out and see, see, um, like be able to search an artist's name and get that artist's work that they're tagged in, uh, mm -hmm. things like that. Um, and then the search is also uh, really fast because it's using that AWS uh, search technology. Um, so in order to demo that properly, do you have for me like a, a term to search and just to demonstrate exactly uh, exactly the capability of it? Like I just type the name of an artist, for example, and uh, and it's in, it will show up like right away, but also all is, or art, right? Uh, that's how that's how I can go about it. Exactly. Yeah. So a good prompt would be well, I just type uh, Roger and I get an artist here that uh, you can see here, like the name of someone. Uh, if I'm just 
looking at who is the ex latest exhibition just to give it give it a try at um, and it Denzel Forrester for example look Oop, if they don't there you go stuff, yeah so we can find all the art uh, we can find the artist we can find the exhibition if uh, if relevant here uh, and uh, and yeah it's fairly impressive Th that's a nice challenge so next uh, Prismic was kind of limited for use next, but Prismic was kind of limited. Uh, the search full uh, search capability of the API of Prismic was kind of limited to what uh, you wanted to do, so you had to build your own. How complex was it? Um, it wasn't actually that complex. Uh, it what it what we did is we created one endpoint in Next.js to basically pull all of the Prismic content content types and their fields and put it in one in uh, one massive search index. So you're searching artists and, and pages and everything in the same query. Um, but then, and then at the end, it links out, it, it basically returns the Prismic object ID. Okay. Uh, so you're you're getting that that um, that object at the end and then, then it references that and displays that. In the right category. That's really cool. That's really cool. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so we have, let's say, I'm gonna. We have three questions. We're gonna take the question of uh, Greg Miller, who's asking, "How early on did you start thinking about accessibility in the design? Do you use extensions within Figma?" Uh, I'm asking all the questions, and then we can see uh, who's answering which one. <laughs> um, Marianella is saying, "Was the shop of the museum also built using Prismic?" Alex uh, mm. Pearson is saying, "What is your process for client interviews?" Um, and we also have a question from Samuel who, who's asking, do you have a workflow for keeping slices in code and Figma in sync while the website is evolving and, slice, uh, and slices change, new ones get created and so on? So I'm just asking all of them so that uh, you know which ones we'll cover. Mm -hmm. um, but let's, let's start with the one on accessibility. Um, who would be the best person to, to answer that? Jen, do you want to tackle that one? Yeah. Um, yeah, we keep accessibility top of mind when we build our websites. Um, so while we're building every component um, in our PRs, we run through checks that, um, you know, get us through, you know, Lighthouse and um, just checking for basic patterns that we know to look for, contrast um, issues. So we try to do it early on. And then we also have a QA team at the end before we launch that reviews our websites. So. Um, but it is uh, something we talk about with our designers as well. We will uh, send stuff back to them and tell them, oh, we need to, you know, increase the size of this button or um, change the color a bit. But um, and we also go through with our tabbing um, and the, the carousels that we build, making sure that the screen readers are announcing the right things. So it's really important to us. And it's something that we promise our clients as well, that your site will be build ex with accessibility in mind. Awesome. Cool. So it's something that you do in the design phase, but also in, in development. development. And there's kind of a checklist that you go through. And also mostly like there's a QA process that is a big thing also. So that's that's really nice. Cool. Mm -hmm. um, I What was the my the last next question? So we had a question that I remember I can ask you, like what you're looking for, but like how do you manage to keep your slice in sync uh, while iterating on the development process? Like what happens if you actually uh, want to change the slice? How do you manage to keep always development and Figma in sync? Uh, that's a question from Samuel. That's a good question. Uh, we're still trying, we're still learning. We don't really have a process okay. around that. It's, um, I think we basically, once the designers start looking at production, they might have some feedback and then they'll file a ticket and we'll, um, or they'll record a video or like a screenshot and describe kind of what they want. And so there's a little bit of back and forth sometimes, but no, no syncing process like that. Yeah. Okay. Same for us. Like somebody's on our team and he's <laughs> trying to figure that out as well. So that's, that's one thing. <laughs> so we had, I, yeah, I have seen a few new Figma extensions come about and I haven't had a time to like try them myself, but I've seen that they connect Storybook to Figma. So um, that's on my on my radar to try in the future. OK, yeah. very interesting. Uh, Marianella is asking about the shop. I think it's a Shopify one. I, I think I, I, I looked into it. But it's interesting how the 
experience that still feels smooth in terms of brand from one to the other. Uh, but yeah, I'll let you confirm or not. Yeah, that's a that's a Shopify um, and and I, a better site that we've done um, with the Shopify integration is uh, the New York Historical Society website, just nyhistory.org. Um, that is also a Prismic site. And then what we did was um, integrate Shopify. There is a Shopify build uh, separately, um, but there's also a uh, Shopify integration into Prismic, which is really cool too. Uh, so, you know, we're using the Prismic, um, I'm sorry, the uh, Shopify um, API. Oh, no dash on that uh, to kind of bring it in through okay. through the site. There you go. Oh, you, you just added there for a second. Cool. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, this is a really, re probably our biggest Prismic site. It's uh, another museum with uh, lots of content. Um, so this is all slices too as well. And um, some of these exhibition pages have shot, like a shop component that we bring in, um, you know, things that you can buy in the store. I don't know. It's, it's, there's some highlights here. Yeah, or you can browse the collection. So that connects back to the shop, which is a, a Shopify. Um, haven't done anything. So this, we try to match the Shopify site as close to the Prismic site as possible. It's, it's tough, but, um, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, how do you make that experience feel, you know, cohesive and, and similar, yeah. even though they're two different platforms. That's awesome. really cool. That's really cool. Um, Maxine, Sam from our team is, uh, is, uh, is saying that, uh, yeah, he, we're all learning together. He's referring to the um, story, um, storybook plugin that you mentioned. And he said that he actually found it today and he was planning to use it or to try it as well. <laughs> um, and let's say, last okay. question from Alex Pearson, who's also saying that um, what you shared, Jason, uh, what you said, Jason, was an incredible use of the API. Um, he's also asking if you have a process for uh, client interviews of like, I'm guessing here, like who, who do you interview and how do you run the interviews? And that would be our last question for you today before we conclude. Yeah, I can answer that one. We um, we usually try to interview uh, three or four stakeholders uh, across different divisions. So for Kemper, oh, well, New York Historical Society was was very big. We we interviewed um, I, I think close to fifteen different um, people. When you have these big organizations, it's important to get stakeholders, and and each one is going to have something that's really important to them for the website, and so trying to understand what their needs are, what their goals are, what's the problem with the current website for them um, so that you address that with the new website. I also think it's really important, um, you know, to, to gain confidence and to gain trust from these people, um, show that you're listening to them. And then the most important thing I think is also to interview, you know, pe people that are going to use the website. So guests or customers or clients, whoever's going to use the site, you know, interview people that are already fans of the museum or institution or people that have been considering going to the museum or institution that haven't gone yet, you know, what information on the website would really help them, um, you know, understand what the museum stands for, what they would see when they go there, um, why they should go there, you know, are there, you know, for example, Kemper, we, there's a lot of families that want to go there, you know, how do we showcase some of the, you know, family friendly events up front and that kind of thing. So. You know, these little insights come together. Um, Ryan from our strategy team is an, does an amazing job taking all that, you know, interviews and then parsing it together, you know, creating little um, uh, opportunities or insights that we share back to the client. And we just, we go back to the client and go, here's all the things we heard. Here's all the things that we, you know, want to make sure are, are things that we should consider when we're building a new website. And, um, then those get shared to our designers so that they're very aware. Awesome, awesome. Cool. Well, thanks a lot for being here. Um, it's a really uh, successful project. Yep. Um, and let's uh, also, if I just conclude on saying like, what was the reaction of the client? But I want to share uh, two links to the chat. One that is uh, your website uh, link. And the other is uh, the link to your Prismic profile for uh, people to be able to see other projects you've built with Prismic. Because you can, uh, for anyone that is looking actually an, at an agency uh, to maybe build uh, your website or to rework, rebrand, um, if you're in a cultural space or not, like uh, you can actually uh, uh, contact you all five through Prismic. So you can see like uh, what they've done, uh, as Nora was saying, but actually get in contact with them uh, directly from uh, the IR developer, IR agency in that case uh, page. Uh, and so, yes, uh, you can reach out through that way or directly go to usual5.com yeah. um, and, uh, and, uh, and, and reach out to them directly from there. Yeah. 
So Levi, what was the reaction of the clients? Oh, they were incredibly happy. You know, I think um, it, it hit all their goals, you know, really wanted people to know, uh, you know, what the Kemper stands for, especially that they're free and open um, quite a few days a year. Um, the, the work and the, the art there is, is, you know, inclusive and groundbreaking. Um, it's not going to be stale by any means. It's going to be very uh, of the of the moment kind of discussing topics and, and things that are important to them. And then, you know, also showcasing that there's, you know, a restaurant, there's activities, there's events. It's not just, you know, obviously the, the looking and viewing art is important, but, you know, all kinds of fun events. I think that they had, you know, Easter events with frogs and rabbits, all that kind of stuff, you know, just fun, you know, other events that are not just museum related to as well. So um, that was a big, you know, big thing to, to kind of bring to life. And I think that their memberships in there and their visitors have grown since the new website has launched. And um, nice. I'm excited to see where they take it. And it's fun to, you know, give a pro platform to, you know, like Prisnik to the client and let them run with it, update it. Uh, that's the best feeling to see what they do with it, you know, once they have, you know, all the slices and they can do whatever they want now. And so they've done an amazing job keeping it up to date. Awesome, awesome. awesome. Well, thanks everyone for joining. Uh, thanks for the Use All Five uh, team. I'm not saying thanks everyone to all the, the viewers because we have one other section for the next uh, people. But thank you to the to the four of you. It was really great to have you. Super insightful, yeah. and for like also being so open and showing yeah. us your work. That's that that was really cool. Yeah, so thanks thank a lot. You. Thank you for the trust. Thank you for the knowledge sharing and uh, and for your presence today. Uh, means a lot. And thanks. for making great projects as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, thank you for building such a great platform. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Um, for everyone, so I'll leave my space for Lucy, who's going to come. She's um, our Nuxt Developer Experience Engineer. She's also on the Nuxt uh, core, core team. team. And she's uh, come. To, she's going to come to show you a quick demo of the new support of Nuxt 3. So, yeah. But thanks, everyone, for, for being here. And, uh, yeah, I'll let Lucy come just in a second. So what, uh, what we'll go through uh, for the rest of the meetup is actually uh, uh, the, new re the newest release and latest release of Slice Machine. We'll do a focus uh, specifically on Nuxt because like, there is a lot of uh, exciting things that are coming for Nuxt uh, specifically. Next is also uh, being like, uh, improved, uh, the next support. Uh, but we will talk more in depth uh, about it uh, most likely in the future meetup or future videos. Uh, today we de we decided to uh, focus specifically on Nuxt and uh, and the best person to talk about it is Lucy. Uh, so she's hey. there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hi or now, how are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. It was very interesting. Uh, I'm uh, I, w I felt the f uh, the first part of the meetup was really great, like a good rhythm, were really good guest, like uh, very interesting. Uh, and I'm actually very interested in uh, in this part. Cool. I right. need to provide you that. Yes. That's what you meant by. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't see all everything that is coming up like off screen when I when the camera is on me. Like everyone is like pass the cable, pass the cable. So it's now done. Lucy will be able to share uh, our screen and to ba basically guide you through the all the news that uh, that were just shipped. Yeah, that's why we have three cameras to trick people. Exactly. <laughs> but like I I I I, exa I anyway reveal what's happening. Uh, like uh, yeah. So office. well, let's talk about what's happening and what happened just yesterday is that we made a big release for Slice Machine. We released Slice Machine 1.0.0, which is the, well, a big milestone for us. Are we still on 1.0.0? What? Are, are we still, is yes, it, is we, it, is we it still sti the latest? We, we're still on 1.0.0, but actually well, that, that's nice that you brought that in because, well, of course we got some like bug report uh, following the release. Um, thankfully, all of us are like small-ish bug bugs, and like we are already cooking like a uh, hotfix release that should land by the end of the week. So that if you're already using Size Machine 1.0.0 and is experiencing any and are experiencing any trouble with that, it should sort out in a few days. So, well, please brace yourself. Th there is a there is a general say anyway that in engineering that uh, the 1.0.0 never lasts long. <laughs> like uh, it's often something that uh, that you don't see for a long time. Yes, <laughs> and so well, it's version one point oh point oh. So this means we might have brought in like a lot of new things, new features, exciting things. And well, I think we did. And well, as Noah already teased you, uh, well, one of the main things that we're bringing in with this release is next free support. 
So now you'll be able to develop Prismic website with Slice Machine use uh, on Nux, yeah, Prismic Nux free website using Slice Machine. Uh, we already had the SDKs for that, but the Slice Machine integration wasn't there and now it's there. And what I suggest we do is that we start and like uh, install Slice Machine on a Nux free application. Let's go for it. All right. So already I have like a Next application here that I just created using uh, Nuxy, Next free uh, new CLI. And uh, the only thing I did is that I installed Tailwind on it just in case we need to style a few things quickly. And But that's basically it. Like I don't have anything else here. It's just like a bare bone Next app. So to install Slice Machine like we, like we did before, we need to run still the at Slice Machine init command with the at latest flag to just make sure we're using the latest release from NPM. And well, I want to show this process because actually this is another change that we're bringing with this release. We revamped completely the uh, init process of Slice Machine. We re reviewed its experience and like how it's going on and also we improved its performances. So here we go, as you can see, the init process is launching. And uh, well, first thing it asked me to, well, first of all, you can see detected next free. So, well, we're on next free, everything's all right. <laughs> <laughs> um, then it asked me to log in, so let's do that quickly. So it opened my browser here. It's, well, I'm already logged into Prismic, so this should go fairly fast if internet is on my side. It's on You're my side. <laughs> cool. So, well, it's logging into Prismic, and then it asked me to pick a repository to, to log in. So, well, what I will do here is I will create a new repository. And well, and so this is a new creation repository workflow that we have this with this new installation process. And one of the first things that you can see here is it first of all it's suggesting me a name uh, based on the name of my project. So my project here is called April Meetup. And this name appears to be available on Prismix, so I can use it as my name. Um, as, as my the name, name. As a repository name. But if I want to type another one, I can still, and as you can see, it will tell me, and like, well, actually, like right now, if I just add three characters, it's not possible to create a repository mm -hmm. name with three characters. And it tells you about that, um, about it. But also, if you don't, well, repository name have to be uh, kebab case. But if you don't follow this um, syntax here, it will like kebab case it for you automatically. So that, well, you don't, just like much simpler to create a repository. But for us today, we just stick with the April meetup. If it's still available, it's still running, so that's cool. <laughs> 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 I'm not getting stream act. Like no, some, someone like uh, went faster than you and yeah. just uh, took it during. No, it's thing. fine. So, well, so what we did so far, I connected to Prismic, I created a new repository. It installed Slice Machine already, so that's the line that is here. It's already installed Slice Machine, and then it's creating and configuring Slice Machine. It's pushing like data to Prismic, if any, but basically, it's done after that. But and what yep. does done mean? Well, done mean is that uh, your project is now ready to, like, has been configured uh, with Prismic, and you're ready to develop with it. But there's some new things here <laughs> coming on That's with init command. That's what I meant. Yeah. <laughs> 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 but there's some new things coming up with init command. So let's see my project. Let's get back to VS Code here and see what has changed. So, first of all. Uh, as I said, we installed dependencies. So we installed uh, the Next Prismic module, which is the SDK for um, for Next, and we installed Slice Machine. So that's installed for you, but we were doing that before. Yep. A new thing that we're doing now is that we are configuring the Prismic module for you inside your Next configuration. And this is made possible thanks to Magic AST, which is a new library that we've been developing with the Next core team. And this allows us to programmatically update TypeScript files, JavaScript files, to add things in a convenient way inside. As you can see here, it noticed that like I already had Tailwind installed as my module and just added uh, the Prismic module after it. And then it created the configuration for the Prismic module in a clean way, also respecting my code style and convention. And if I comment, it would preserve it. So it's just like cleanly updating a next config to um, configure Prismic module. So that's great. That's already one thing less for you to do when you create uh, a Prismic website with Next 3 or even Next 2 because you already made that with Next 2. Yes, but because some of the changes that uh, Lucy is presenting here are not only related to Next 3, this new version of Slice Machine are basically bringing those changes to ne Next 2 
um, next three, some of those changes to next uh, also. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, if you're next JS users, like uh, use all five where, uh, we also did some some of that. For example, ver well, there's a different init process with uh, Next.js, and we're also like creating more files and things like that. And one file that we're not creating for every new Slice Machine project, whether it's Next.js or, ne or Next.js, is this Slice Simulator page. So it's not automatically created for you by default if you don't have one. And well, again, that's just a convenience where you don't need to set it up. It will be created for you. So if you don't know what is the simulator, just before Jen was talking about it, like it's actually a way to preview your slice in isolation and to develop them thanks to mock data. So it like streamlines the process of developing slices in isolation. So use all five and Jen used it um, and uh, are interested into it. Uh, this will basically allow you to have access to it and to test it um, more easily because you don't have to have to install it or to configure basically your project to support it. Exactly. So, well, and finally, Slice Machine created its configuration file and it just said that it's running with Next. So, well, that's what the init command is doing. Uh, but now let's get it up and running and let's launch Slice Machine. So, at the end of the init command, it tells me, well, to get started, I need to run Slice Machine. So, I can run Slice Machine. And it also tells me to run my project. So, well, we'll, we'll do that also after. Mm -hmm. But basically, if I now go uh, to my um, to my local slice machine URL, so it's not this one. Let's just get it refresh, which I hope it should work. Because if it doesn't, internet issue. No, it's well, it's slow. <laughs> 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 um, well, that's well. I, I was already thinking. I was like, I would say during this demo, like, well, that's the demo effect. Well, here we go. <laughs> um, I don't know if my internet is like acting up or something, but I have a backup project in case. <laughs> okay. So what's happening exactly? Well, nothing. Um, Just the init, uh, uh, the init is being stuck? Oh, no well, it's, um, I'm trying to launch this machine and it's just hanging up in the void, which it didn't before. Yeah. Okay, no. All right. Here okay. we go. Um, well, we'll put that on Windows. <laughs> I think that's <laughs> that's the way to go. Um, <laughs> but well, Slice Machine is now up and running. You can see here's the uh, UI picked up. And well, you can see I, I don't have any slice, I don't have any custom type. So let's just create a quick slice uh, together. So I'll create like a hero slice. And the reason I'm doing that is that because I want also to show you the new TypeScript integration with Next that now works with Next. Uh, Next.js users already had it. But because now with U3, we have great TypeScript support, we're able to integrate better with uh, TypeScript. So let's add a few fields to my slice. So I will add like an editing field. I will add... Um, that we just did. Uh, we just did... Uh, um, well, I prefer to fail now than with... Uh, a joke on Windows and then Windows... All right, we're back. So okay, well... As you go, as we go, as we're gonna say, well, we joked about Windows. No, it our it crashed again, it seems. It ah, no, okay. No, it no, okay. okay. So, yeah, well, our streaming computer is also Windows and it's failing us. So, <laughs> well, I guess the Mars stories don't work on Windows. Um, it's the last time you're missing that. <laughs> 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 so, okay, so just to recap, uh, we created a slice, or error slice, with three fields, and I, w and I wanted to do that to show you the new TypeScript integration with the uh, next three. So I saved it to the file system, and now getting back to my code, I have a slices directory with my hero slice, and inside it, um, well, inside it I have all this content here. Uh, it's not happy, so I just like for well, restart TypeScript, uh, I guess, but it should be fine after that. Here we go. Um, oh, or do I need to? Yes, I will need to start next now. So let's just start next server. And the reason for that is that Next, when you start Next, uh, it builds all the types for your project and watches them. So if I don't start Next, it won't pick up that well, like, oh, you installed Prismic. So maybe there is some things to do with that. So here, I started Next. I guess we can open it uh, here. So basically, since you changed like your slice, you created new type that were not watched, and so it didn't update. And now that it's being watched, like uh, it's going to exactly. update. Exactly, so now it should be fine as soon as it started, which should be fairly quick was before. All right, so yeah, actually it picked up my types here, so you can see it seems to be happy with that now. And the now if I were here and I get 
type to when I start to type like to get access to my slice, which is one of the prop my slice receive, I can now access like my slice primary item, which is like the non-repeatable zone of your slice. And you can see here it's already typed with my body, my heading, and my image, which were the three fields I declared here on my slice. And that's also well, so that's automatically typed. If you try to access something else, uh, it won't. Well, it won't. It will whine at you because well, it doesn't exist on this slice. But so it's only well, that's the beauty of TypeScript basically. Mm. And so well, so well, that's the main thing. And I guess well, one of one of the last thing we can do to just like quickly showcase a few things, we can go to the uh, slice simulator. So we we'll go to it. It that will, yeah, tell. That, will, that was installed automatically uh, with the new init. Exactly, so the simulator is already installed. Uh, although it will prompt me to add one thing, I think, I don't know. Yes, it will prompt me to add just the URL of it, which we cannot guess for you. So that's this part here. Update your slice machine config JSON. Um, by default, the URL is right, so I guess maybe there's some improvement for us to yep. do on that here. But I will just add this line here. I'll paste it here and we'll just make sure everything's all right on my terminal. <laughs> should be. Yeah. Um, and now if I restart that, we should now see my slice, which will be really small. Um, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll wait for it to load. Um, when it load, so I have my slice here with the default uh, value. Uh, one thing we can do, for example, we can like use the prismic image component to render our image, and we'll do like slice. And here you can see it's like typed already, so I can know what's available, and I can access my image automatically. Same for, by the way, we didn't discuss it quickly, but like that's good to finish. But like yeah. the snippets are being updated also to fit like basically your your style and stuff like that. Yes, exactly. Um, so well, and you can see here, here I'm rendering my image, so it's, this is like quite ugly. But as <laughs> <laughs> but as I told you, like I, I installed Tailwind earlier, so I have like this slice here. It is using the same field. We can just copy paste to get like a, a nicer view of my hero <laughs> slice. And now if I go back here, you can see I have a slice that looks a bit more like a slice that we know. Uh, we can update a few things, so like we can like add more like uh, this is my cool title. Thanks to the simulator, which I think it's a oh I don't know why it's looking weird here. Uh, well, never mind. Style. <laughs> Maybe some style issue, yeah. And well, you can use the mock and everything. You can save your mock to the file system like before, and you can take a screenshot, and it will hopefully take the screenshot, make it easier, or maybe in the better way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, so we have a screenshot, and if we go back to the other tab here. Uh, it should refresh in a few with my screenshot right here. Wonderful. Yeah, wonderful. So again, uh, right now we did the demo with Next3. Um, so everything is working with Next3. But of course, all the new features we showcase, so like the new install process, the better TypeScript integration and everything, all of that is available both for Next and Next.js. And so better integration means like uh, looking at your code, like uh, actually adapting the templates, also the slice template uh, to be better suited to fit like the way Next.js developer and Next.js developer actually work. Um, because that's something that we got in the past as a, let's say a complaint or at least a request to improve. So this is being improved. Um, yeah. Can you can you tell us maybe f f like, um, so uh, I can do it, but like uh, we we also rework the storybook integration in a sense. We are reworking on the storybook integration, so it might be just um, something that uh, if you are like uh, relying a lot on the storybook integration cu currently for your for your workflow with Slice Machine, it's not being supported in 1.0.0. We are going to reintroduce it soon, but we remove the support to be able to release this new big change uh, in the way uh, Slice Machine is being implemented. But um, so you might want to wait a bit uh, before uh, getting to, to the 1.0.0 if you are like uh, deep down into storybook and size machine integration. And what's the process to migrate and to actually uh, uh, install 1.0.0 if you are like in the previous version? Okay, so sure. I if you're on a previous version of size machine to migrate to the new version of size machine, all you need to do is update the version of size machine inside your package JSON, uh, install the dependencies, 
and then when you will start size machine again it will perform the necessary migration for you so it will like um yeah like move things around the way they need to be moved and so on and so on it might trigger like quite some like uh, diffs in your git uh, like git uh, status mug but uh well you can review them and if there's anything that looks off you can fix well you're you're able to fix it if there's <laughs> anything that off <laughs> but uh, of course we try our best to uh like reduce any kind of like uh, migration requirement on your end and uh, also like any issues that are caused to them but it's not like a, a perfect science uh, but well, we try our best and we, uh, as I said, we have a fix that will land by the end of the week uh, for the first few bugs we identified with this release. Um, also, uh, you talked about Next.js. Uh, there's one feature that uh, we know you're all excited about for Next.js. It's the app directory. So just uh, as a clarification, like today, uh, today at Prismic, we support uh, Next 13, but we don't support the app directory. However, we've been working this month on supporting the app directory and for next users, I have a great news for you is that the app directory support for Prismic of Next 13 will land next week. So very exciting, uh, very exciting uh, new updates that are coming. Um, Let's not let's not steal the show also of this release because it, well, it wasn't clear, it seems for some people in the chat. So. Yeah. We released the 1.0.0 yesterday. Yes. It's now supporting Next 3. It's now supporting Next 3 in uh, like in a very uh, interesting and uh, and uh, a very deep. It's very deeply integrated wi with Next 3, supporting TypeScript, um, and it's now available. Like right now, you can go mm -hmm. to uh, your project and uh, actually update Size Machine, and you will be you will have a Next 3 support with Size Machine starting now. Um, it's being like uh, rolled out, so a, few, a lot of people are now uh, basically up, uh, upgrading. To simplify this uh, upgrade process, we actually uh, put in place a, a lot of script to remove, to do the heavy lifting, basically, and to remove work for you. Um, in the meantime, we are patching some few things that people are uh, reporting to us. It's very limited in the amount of things. You could expect a, you can expect a, a patch this week. And next week, uh, you should hear like some news about uh, next uh, 13 app directory support. Yes. And also next week, we'll have the uh, next three documentation up on our website. I think the next three documentation is on our website. I don't think so. Uh, yeah? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, well, if it is right now, it's cool. Uh, but uh, well, we have like a, we had like a slight delay with the next three documentation. So well, we would have like to have it at the same time. Uh, so yeah, it's coming next week. If you don't really know next Prismic and like next three, um, yes, not there yet. Okay. But uh, we'll have like a next free button on our doc on our documentation by next week. Uh, well, next week, um, so that you can like have a complete walkthrough of everything I showed you today, and uh, get up and running with uh, next free and Prismic if you have any trouble. But the support is there, as I just emailed you. <laughs> <laughs> You have in-app documentation anyway also with Slice Machine, so you still have the ints if you want to get them. You now have types also if you want to uh, actually template your... Exactly, uh, and for uh, Prismic and uh, Next3, like we have the uh, Prismic uh, Next3 website where you can... Um, we already have like a lot of information about how Prismic works with Next3, just not the Slice Machine part of it. All right, so I guess that's all for us. And now, if you have any question, we can answer you. About anything, about Usual 5, about uh, Prismic and Next, Prismic and Next, we are happy to That's answer right. you. <laughs> what? Oh, okay. So <laughs> someone wrote to me. I didn't know. It. Okay. So it's true. Uh, so we have. Uh, in a Q&A, Hendrik that asked us, what about bidirectional relationship and a useful search? <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, yes, it hurts a bit, but <laughs> it's true. It's, uh, it's, um, so there is two things. Uh, on the bidirectional relationship, I'm happy to discuss a bit more with you, uh, Hendrik, uh, to understand a bit better your use case, so please. If you can hit me up on Twitter, I would like to understand a bit better either Prismic or myself directly. 
so that we can discuss this uh, d the use case to see um, if it's relevant. It's not something that we are considering at the moment, like, uh, but I would like to know more about it to see how we can uh, actually solve your problem. On the search, we know it's a complaint that, uh, that we have. Uh, many people are reporting it. It's something that is uh, very high in our considered list. So we are working in a few items uh, at the moment that, that, are, that you can see on the progress page. Um, so slice machine uh, being one of the one of the main um, area of work. We are now dedicating more and more um, power to work on our editor. And so we are going to have a few set of uh, releases coming on that front uh, in the next few months. We'll talk about it more in details, maybe in the next meetup or uh, directly on uh, through uh, through our communication channel. Uh, and so it's the top priority for now. Search will come most likely uh, after those first items. Um, Will crop work images are 4,000 pixel plus? I don't have the context exactly of uh, the, yeah, the uh, question. Okay, so that's in the uh, mock editor or ah, the okay. simulator. Uh, by default, it, it gives you really big images. Uh, this can be changed um, by configuring your field. So actually, I, c I could show you. Um, like you can configure your image field. So if I go back to my image here, I can go to my image. And I can configure constraints to my image. So I can say that, well, I, ju I only want like uh, 800 uh, pixel width images. I can save that and now it will generate uh, 800 pixel width images for me. Um, there's other things you can do to control your image size. So you can use leverage image X query parameters to like uh, generate image on the fly that fits your constraints. And we have helpers to help you and assist you in that endeavor. Because it's transparent, you might not know it, but like actually under the hood for all images being delivered through uh, the asset.prismic.io uh, domain, uh, it's coming from Imagix. So you can apply any query parameter that Imagix, the Imagix API, um, uh, how do you say, uh, comply with, like uh, um, expect or um, support. Sorry, that's the word that I was looking for. So support, and uh, you'll be able to programmatically resize, crop your images, or you can use the responsive images feature that Lucy just showed you. Um, and again, like uh, we also have like uh, components and helper to simplify the work of programmatically resizing and cropping, uh, cropping images. Yeah. Um, I didn't note. <laughs> so I don't see more questions here. Uh, I guess we are good. Um, thanks a lot uh, for being there. We wanted to mention something that is uh, the fact that. Uh, but you are more and more, uh, you, you, the, the, the size of the community and the people following us, coming to the meetup, looking at the video that we are um, creating is uh, growing uh, uh, nonstop. So we just um, we just uh, passed the bar of the 10,000 subscribers on YouTube. Uh, we are very, very uh, glad uh, of uh, that, that uh, so many people are now joining us and, and looking at this content. It means a lot for the whole team uh, and for us. And so we wanted to thank you for that. There is, uh, I guess, uh, a series of video that is uh, showing up uh, also that will show that will come like uh, in the next few days and, uh, and week because we did an operation uh, on that front to, to have uh, ask me anything. So we are going to release a series of videos uh, following that. And, uh, and so if you want to continue following uh, us and uh, having more content, uh, if you feel that the content that we are providing for you is uh, relevant, interesting, and uh, enjoyable, bah, subscribe to the YouTube channel and uh, come back uh, next month. So we do those meetups every month, uh, the last Wednesday of the month. And, uh, and uh, I'll be there. I hope you'll be there too. And, uh, and in the meantime, uh, have a, a very nice uh, a month and experience with Prismic. And ciao, ciao. Bye. <laughs>